Today, we examine the most fantastic chess moves. Moves that are extremely difficult to spot, but can make all the difference. To find these moves, you need to recognize the positions where they can happen. And that comes from understanding how the initiative works in chess. This concept is described in Isaac Lipnitsky's remarkable book Questions of Modern Chess Theory, and a quotation explaining it is shown on the right side of your screen. The game we are analyzing today shows how we can spot the greatest moves by applying the concept of initiative. So let's dive in. Lipnitsky's opponent starts with d4, Lipnitsky plays knight f6 and after knight f3 and e6 white goes for the caller system. E3. The idea is to reinforce the d4 pawn with c3, after which white is going to take under full control the crucial central e4 square by developing the bishop on d3 and the knight on d2, and after castling, when the right time comes, white is going to break in the center with e4, opening the bishop's diagonal and ideally initiating an attack on black's kingside. d5 followed. Bishop d3, Lipnitsky attacks the central pawn with c5, white reinforces the d4 pawn with c3, and after knight c6, knight d2, bishop d6, both sides castled. Now that white has the full control over the e4 square, he might think about the e4 advance. But if he plays e4 right away, opening the bishop's diagonal and threatening to push the pawn to e5, forking the bishop and the knight, black can simply capture on d4, so white cannot play e5, he must first capture on d4, and after that black will capture on e4 too, and after knight takes e4, as you see, white will stay with an isolated pawn and will have no advantage. For this reason, instead of the immediate e4 advance, uh, white, in order to prevent the creation of an isolated pawn on d4, first exchanges the pawns, and only after bishop takes c5, he plays e4. Not only opening the bishop's diagonal, but also creating a possible threat of e5. If the white pawn invades the e5 square, it will put pressure on black's position, kicking out the knight from f6 and opening the bishop's diagonal. So that might be quite dangerous, white can initiate a very strong attack on the black king in this case. For this reason, <coughs> uh, black must think about ways of preventing it. But if black, in order to prevent the e5 advance, captures this pawn, then white will solve all his problems. At the moment, as you see, his position is a little bit cramped, the knight is standing in front of the bishop, but in this case white would capture on e4, attacking the bishop, and after the exchange white will have a slight advantage, as his pieces are more active, as you see, both bishops are quite active, while black hasn't solved the problem of his bad bishop yet. Besides that, white has a pawn majority on the queen side, three pawns against the two pawns, so he has the possibility of creating a passed pawn on the queen side. So white would be slightly better. For this reason, after white pushed the pawn to e4, instead of capturing on e4, in order to prevent the advance of the pawn to e5, Lipnitsky plays queen c7 taking the e5 square under control. White renews the threat, queen e2. The queen supports the possible advance of the pawn. That's why one more time Lipnitsky prevents it by playing knight g4. Now both black knights together with the queen control this square. White kicks the knight out of g4. Now if the knight retreats to f6, then of course white will push the pawn. That's why the knight moves to e5, attacking the bishop. In order to uh, retain the bishop, uh, white retreats it to c2, and now black tries to solve the problem of his bad bishop. He plays b6, preparing the fianchetto of it. White increases the pressure on the e-file, rook e1, creating an immediate threat of e takes d, after which the black knight would fall under attack. It will be attacked three times. For example, if black carelessly plays bishop b7, white would capture and black doesn't have time to recapture, as his knight is under attack, so black would be forced to exchange the knights first with a check, but then again white would solve his problem. He will play knight takes f3, opening the bishop's diagonal, and after black recaptures, white would execute a standard sacrifice. He will 
um, initiate a devastating attack with bishop takes h7 check and after king takes h7 knight g5 check if the king moves to g8 then after queen h5 there is no defense against the checkmate so the king must move to g6 and he will become a target of a terrible attack for this reason after rook e1 <coughs> As white is threatening to capture on d5, to prevent this, Lipnitsky pushes the pawn forward to d4. White exchanges a pair of knights, knight takes e5, knight takes e5, then he captures on d4, and after bishop takes d4, the white bishop is under attack, but white prepared knight b3, defending his bishop and attacking the black bishop in his turn. And we have reached the critical position where black has a fantastic move, a hidden move. But how are we supposed to know that it's exactly in this position black must have this great move? In order to recognize these positions, we must know how the initiative works. At the moment, it's clear that black has the initiative, because he has great centralized minor pieces. The bishop is putting pressure on white's king side, pinning the f-pawn. The knight is um, occupying a great blockading central square. The black queen is very strong, putting pressure on the c-file, targeting the bishop and tying the white queen to its defense. Besides that, the black queen is also targeting white's king side, while white in his turn hasn't developed his queen side yet. His bishop is passive, is bad, as it's restricted by its own pawn. And his queen and rook are also passive. They are placed on the closed e-file. So it's clear that black has the initiative. However, black also has a problem. His bishop is under attack. And if black makes the obvious move, bishop c5, then he loses the initiative and initi initiative passes to white. White would have captured the bishop and after queen takes c5, white already has the advantage of two bishops. He develops his bishop with a tempo and after the queen retreats, let's say to c7, white finishes his development with rook c1 and uh, gets a better position. So white would have, uh, black would have lost his initiative in this case. So if black has the initiative at this point and obvious moves lose it the obvious bishop c5 loses the initiative that means there must be a hidden great move that maintains and develops the initiative and the knowledge of this concept helped lipnitsky to find the great unexpected hidden move and you can pause the video and try to find it too what to do the bishop is under attack The fantastic move comes like a thunderbolt from a clear sky. Bishop a6, attacking the white queen and letting her capture the bishop. What if white accepts the sacrifice? What if the queen captures on a6? White wins a piece. Besides that, the dark squared bishop is still under attack. What has Lipnitsky prepared? You can pause the video one more time and try to find it. <clears throat> so, the idea behind bishop a6 was to develop the piece, one more piece, the light squared bishop, with a tempo. And if white accepted the sacrifice, the queen, uh, which used to be on e2, would be deflected from this square. And, of course, black wouldn't have captured the unguarded bishop. That wasn't the idea. If black does that, then after knight takes d4, white is still up a piece with a winning position. The idea of the deflection of the white queen from e2 was a different one. From e2, the queen was defending the f3 square. And now that she's deflected, the knight would have invaded this square in order to destroy white's kingside and open the queen's diagonal. So, knight f3 is a check. And uh, white has only three moves, king, F1, uh, king h1, king f1, and g takes f. If white accepts the sacrifice of the second piece, then the bishop has still survived. It is still pinning the f-pawn, so the black queen can invade with a check 
and that leads to checkmate. If the king moves to f1, checkmate in one would follow, and if he moves to h1, then queen takes f3 check, king h2, queen takes f2 check, and then the rook falls, and that leads to a checkmate. If the king moves to h1, uh, of course, he gets checkmated in one move. So the only reply white has would be king f1. But in this case, black simply captures the rook. White still doesn't have time to eliminate this bishop, as his own bishop is also under attack, so he must capture the knight. And now the queen would capture on c2. And after knight takes d4, white has the material advantage. He has two minor pieces for the rook. However, black continues his attack. He captures on e4 with a check, also attacking the knight. And the only two moves to save the piece are either knight e2 or bishop e3, but it doesn't really matter, black's reply would be the same. Let's say white plays bishop e3, which looks more logical as white develops the piece, but black would capture on g2, h3 is also uh, lost after that, and black gets the material advantage, and his attack on the exposed white king continues. For this reason, after the fantastic move bishop a6, white declined the uh, sacrifice. Instead of capturing the bishop, he moved his queen. But the queen has only two squares, because she must also keep an eye on the bishop, so the only two squares are d2 or d1. And if she moves to d2, then again she would stop controlling the f3 square and again the knight would invade and again after queen g3 check, king h1, black would eliminate both pawns, h3 pawn, then f3, uh, uh, f3 pawn with checks, and then finally the bishop would capture on f2, black is threatening checkmate, and the rook is under attack, so white's position collapses. For this reason, the only uh, move after bishop a6, as uh, queen takes a6 or queen d2 doesn't work, is queen d1. From d1, the queen defends the bishop and keeps an eye on the crucial f3 square. So, black managed to increase his initiative with bishop a6. Now he has one more developed piece, the light squared bishop. However, he still faces the same problem. His dark squared bishop is still under attack. And if it retreats, again the initiative would have passed to white. After knight takes c5, white again would get the advantage of two bishops and would finish his development. So, Again, that means uh, after queen d1, black must look for some hidden opportunities. So what to do? His bishop is under attack. You can pause the video and try to find it. So the white queen is placed on the open d-file and she is also tied to the defense of the bishop and Lipnitsky exploits that. If the bishop cannot retreat, if that leads to the loss of the initiative, that means it's time for drastic measures, as Lipnitsky writes. It, it often happens that uh, in order the only way of uh, maintaining and developing the initiative is to take drastic measures. So the bishop sacrifice follows. In order to uh, expose the white king and open the defile, now the rook is developed with a tempo, and the queen cannot move, as she must defend the bishop. So the only thing white can do is to close the d-file, either by bishop d2 or knight, knight d2. It doesn't matter. The minor piece on d2 will be pinned, and that will be very unpleasant. Of course, it doesn't make much, much sense to play knight d2, as the knight would close the bishop's diagonal and white would have difficulties in finishing his development. Black would develop the second rook, again with a tempo, threatening to capture the bishop, and the bishop must defend the d3 square, otherwise the black knight would invade with a check. So the bishop must retreat to the first rank and all white pieces would be placed on the first rank, they are very passive. The only piece which is placed on the second rank, the knight, would be pinned, the king is exposed, while all black pieces are as active as possible, and black would continue his attack on the white king with queen c5 check. 
For this reason, after rook d8, instead of knight d2, white plays bishop d2, which is a stronger move, vacating the c1 square for the rook. Now, if black makes the natural move rook c8, white would defend his bishop with rook c1, creating an unpleasant x-ray. And again, white would have seized the initiative in this case. For this reason, instead of rook c8, Lipnitsky plays knight c4, putting more pressure on the pinned bishop. And he's going to get his piece back, after which he will be up a pawn. He's threatening to capture on d2, and after knight takes d2, queen f4 check, and the queen will also target the knight. For example, if white makes the obvious move, rook c1, then after knight takes d2, knight takes d2, queen f4 check, king g1, black captures, getting the piece back, he's up a pawn, his rook is dominating the second rank, black is winning. For this reason, in order to prevent the invasion of the black queen on f4, white plays e5, closing the diagonal and opening his bishop's diagonal. Lipnitsky captures on d2, and after knight takes d2, white is still up a piece, but all black needs to do to get his piece back is to attack the pinned knight for the second time by the queen. So, queen c5 check which will be followed by queen b4, and the knight will be lost. Rook e3 followed, and queen b4. So, what should white do now? The knight is under attack, and black is threatening not just get the piece back, but also win the white queen after rook takes d2 check. If white defends his knight with king uh, e1, then black has a strong move, queen d4. Centralizing the queen, attacking the rook, and what should white do now? He has no moves. Queen e2 is impossible to defend the rook, as the bishop controls this square. Queen f3 doesn't work either, because of queen takes d2 checkmate. How else can white defend the rook? If knight f1, then black would move the queen away from the d-file with a tempo, with a check, opening the rook's way, and white is losing the queen. And finally, if... Uh, if after, uh, after king e1 and queen d4, white moves his rook, it doesn't really matter where, let's say to e2, the, the black queen invades g1 with a check, and again, that would be the end. But white found an interesting opportunity. He, instead of king e1, he sacrifices the bishop. And if black accepts the sacrifice, White would unpin his knight, so he would get a chance to move his queen away from the d-file with a tempo, and after king g8, it's true, the knight and the b2 pawn are under attack, but white can defend both weaknesses with knight b3, and materially the position would be equal. Of course, positionally, black has some advantage on account of, a more, of more active pieces, but white can continue the resistance. For this reason, Instead of accepting the sacrifice, Lipnitsky moves his king to f8 and he still is threatening to capture on d2, winning the white queen. That's why king g1 followed. Now black of course could have captured on d2 right away, but as the knight is doomed anyways, Lipnitsky first wins a pawn. White finally unpins his knight by queen c1 and only now black captures the knight threatening to capture on g2, that's why white is forced to exchange the queens, and black transitions into a winning endgame, where he has an extra pawn and a very active rook, which is dominating the second rank, the a2 pawn is weak, the rook is tied to the defense of this pawn, black has the pawn majority on the queen side, two pawns against the one pawn, so he will have the opportunity to create a passed pawn, so it's a winning endgame. But unfortunately, Lipnitsky got into time trouble and couldn't convert his extra pawn. The game ended in a draw. But now, I recommend watching Lipnitsky's brilliant surprise winning masterpiece, where he gradually develops the initiative, paralyzes his opponent, and finishes the game with a beautiful checkmate. But first, like this video and subscribe, as it's really helpful for the channel growth.